about anything about sleep really, uh, but REM behavior disorder is uh, one of my favorite topics to speak about. So I have to first of all apologize for being in my scrubs, for not having my hair done and looking as nice as Laurie, um, who always looks super nice, but I am on hospital call and so I've been wearing a mask all day. Um, and so I do wanna give a shout out first of all to all the frontline workers um, who are doing this consistently. So ICU doctors, ED doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, who um, I have, I had, I do this like maybe like one week every three or four months to help out. Um, and the majority of my practice is sleep because I'm a neurologist um, and I do do strokes sometimes, but there are frontline workers who are consistently doing this day in and day out, wearing masks 12 hours a day. and it is hard to wear an N95 mask for extended periods of time. Um, it's hot, it's hard to breathe, it's, um, it's not like the mask that we wear, you know, out to the grocery store. So I have gained a very new appreciation for all of our frontline workers, um, EMS people, essential workers, uh, grocery store workers, everybody, really. It's, it's really a uh, changing time that we live in. So I'm going to share my screen. I just want to make sure that you guys are able to see it. Um, okay, and I want to make sure this is the right one, first of all. Okay, and I'm going to blow it up. Are you able to see the full screen with my PowerPoint? Not yet. Nope. Okay, let me try again then. Okay, so let me do this. Okay, now let me share it. Are you able to see it now? Yeah, now we can. Okay. Great. And are you able to see the see the blown up version? Uh, there it is. Perfect. Okay. Very good. Okay. So um, yeah. So I am a sleep neurologist. Um, I do want to mention that um, we do have a new sleep fellowship. Um, so it's where we train um, physicians to become sleep specialists, and um, we don't have enough sleep physicians for all the patients who need. Uh, to be seen for sleep disorder. So if you guys know any physicians who want to be trained in sleep medicine, please send them our way. And we're starting our interviews next week, which is really- Can I have them back? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, so what we love to do is train them and then send them out into the community to help um, exactly. see patients. So absolutely, Lori. And then uh, we are looking for um, people to uh, be engaged in um, the fellowship as well for the educational component. So I'm going to be reaching out to you, Lori, for that component as well, for your okay. techs, for you, um, for your physicians to help us in training these uh, physicians as well. I do have some disclosures. Uh, we do have some research. Um, I'm a speaker for some of the pharmaceutical companies, but none that I'm going to be discussing today. Um, I'm in, I'm, I am going to be talking about some medications that are considered off-label. Um, they're not necessarily approved for REM behavior disorder, but they are kind of uh, universally used for REM behavior disorder. And I know I keep saying RBD or REM behavior disorder, and people are like, what is that exactly? Well, there, this is a perfect drawing of it. And if you don't know who Frank Netter is, he was an American surgeon um, who um, unfortunately passed away, but he was a famous medical illustrator who has basically drawn every organ of the body. And um, all the surgeons who um, have performed surgery learn every essential organ of the body, every structure of the body based on um, his drawings. And he nicely captured REM behavior disorder, which is this drawing you see. And so it's this gentleman here, uh, REM behavior disorders, typically in older folks, but it can happen in younger folks as well. And it's this guy who's dreaming next to his wife and he's punching. So he's dreaming of being Muhammad Ali. He probably was a, a boxer in his earlier days and he is acting out his dreams. And you can see the fear in his wife um, who is scared of being punched. And that is what REM behavior disorder is. So REM is, REM sleep is your deepest sleep. Everybody has REM sleep. You typically go into REM sleep about two hours after you fall asleep, and it is your most restful sleep. It's where you're consolidating your memories, it's where you fall into deep sleep, and it's where you have dreams. You may not remember your dreams, but your mind is active, but your body should be paralyzed. That is normal REM sleep. It is abnormal when you're dreaming about 
being in a boxing match or being chased by a bear and then actually acting it out. That is considered abnormal. And that is when something is wrong, necess um, uh, in essence. So parasomnia is basically a fancy word that we use. It's a medical term that says that something undesirable, whether it's acting out or speaking out, so it's like sleepwalking or sleep talking, is happening in sleep. And it is very disruptive to the person sleeping or your bed partner, who is usually the one that is most bothered. Okay, um, and let uh, Les Miserables, if you've, you've had the fortune of seeing it, I have not on Broadway, I'd like to, um, but uh, she, she nicely described it as like when the tigers come out at night and their voice is soft as thunder and they tear your hope apart and they tear your dream to shame, so it's often very frightening to people. Okay, and there are different parasomnias. There are some that happen outside of REM sleep, so it's not necessarily associated with dreaming, and we often see these in kids. So um, if you remember maybe when your children were um, young, um, they would have confusional arousals where they'd wake up, and we call them night terrors, and they'd wake up screaming in pure terror, or they'd be sleepwalking or sleep uh, sleep talking or sleep walking. And then um, later on, people have REM sleep disorder, where again, they're acting out their dreams. And then there are other kind of more rare parasomnias where it's like bedwetting um, in, in adulthood, it's groaning, um, it's ex exploding head syndrome, which is very rare. I've actually only seen one case in my career. Um, and then it's other kind of dissociative disorders. So we, we won't talk about those today. I'm sure Lori has had a, a seminar on it before, but it's like weird, I shouldn't say weird stuff, but it's like um, nighttime sex omnias. They're a real thing, okay? Um, and they're, they're really fascinating, actually. Um, but as a neurologist, it's really, I get a lot of these consults because it's really important to differentiate REM behavior disorder from other pretty scary things. So like seizures, um, sometimes they are hard to differentiate from seizures and that's where the testing comes into play. And then we also get some um, psychiatric disorders that can sometimes look like REM behavior disorders. So we get um, PTSD in a lot of our veterans who have been in uh, the Vietnam War, for example, and have flashbacks in the middle of the night. And um, as you know, that they've, been, they've lived through horrible um, recurrences of things that they've lived during uh, warfare. And they'll have nightmares that look like REM behavior disorder, but they're actually flashbacks. And there are very different ways to treat those um, that are uh, different than the ways we would treat REM behavior disorder. And again, that's where the sleep study would come into play. So um, when we differentiate REM, so deep sleep parasomnias from non-REM parasomnias, we look at the time of the night that they typically occur. And it does take your brain a while to get into REM. So typically REM parasomnia, so I'm going to call it RBD, happens in the second half of the night. Whereas your non-REM parasomnias, which we typically see in childhood, so, you know, the night terrors, the sleepwalking, the sleep talking, happen in the first, like, one or two hours that people fall asleep. And then the RBD, or the REM parasomnias, occur in the early morning hour. So we typically see those between, like, 2 and 5 a.m., and that's pretty characteristic. There are also ways we differentiate it, um, where uh, younger people usually have the non-REM parasomnias. REM behavior disorder typically happens in the older ones. Um, there's not a family history. Um, they're less interactive um, with you as well, and that's how we kind of distinguish it when we evaluate the patient. The way I help um, distinguish it from seizures is whether they've had a family history of seizures, whether they've had any trauma to the brain, um, whether they've had injury to the brain in, in terms of a stroke or meningitis as a child, any developmental issues, um, again, family history of seizures, and whether it's um, every night when they have the recurrence of um, the event, whether it is very stereotyped meaning it's the same kind of event that happens every single night. So if they have shaking of the arm, for example, and it's always the right arm, that is more typical of a seizure than it is of a REM behavior disorder. 
okay? So usually REM behavior disorder is very mixed up. It's variable every night, whereas a seizure is very, very typical every night. And the um, bed partner can predict what a seizure is going to look like. So remember, REM behavior disorder is dream enactment. Um, it's usually associated with a dream, and the person is acting out that dream. And we call it the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde syndrome, because when you meet the patient, um, and they're usually brought in by the bed partner, they're the nicest people you can ever meet. Okay, they're gentle, they're sweet, and then um, their wife or their husband will say, in the middle of the night, I'm terrified of them, because all of a sudden, they become violent, they become aggressive, and I've had to leave the bed because I'm so scared that they're going to punch me, and they're usually not this type of person. That is the typical story that we hear, okay? It is usually due to dysfunction of the brain, and we've realized that based on um, imaging studies, based on what we call DAT scans, and um, we know that it is related to some type of pathological process within the brain. So um, interestingly, your brain looks kind of like, a, I guess, like kind of like a cauliflower, maybe. <laughs> so um, the bulk of your brain um, is this part. It's the part that sits up here. And then it sits kind of on a brain stem, okay? And your brain stem is um, responsible for your breathing. It's responsible for your heart rate. Um, but it's also responsible for your REM, um, your REM sleep. And in REM sleep, in normal REM sleep, it sends these, in the red part, these activating signals during REM sleep. Um, to kind of suppress your movement, and then inhibitory signals to your spinal cord. So it's in these blue segments here to stop your movement as well. It's all a very coordinated process. And so what happens in this on this side of the uh, diagram, when you have tumors, when you have uh, metabolic derangement, so things like your glucose being too high, um, when you have exposure to like heavy metals, like lead, for example, um, when you have a stroke in that area, um, certain, certain medications like high doses of antidepressants, for example, um, it causes dysfunction in the brainstem and it can cause REM behavior disorder. Okay, and we then call it something called iatrogenic REM behavior disorder, which is caused by something else. And a lot of times, if it's caused by medications, oftentimes we can remove those medications and the REM behavior disorder can go away. And that's always something that we consider. And so we'll always look at your medications first. REM behavior disorder is pretty rare. Okay, so the prevalence based on uh, phone interviews is estimated to be 0.5%. The highest prevalence is actually among men greater than 50 years of age. And then the highest prevalence is among Parkinson's patients. But we, we made it on the map, okay? Not only are we a hotspot for COVID, but um, Sun City West, when we um, did a survey, they did surveys um, in various parts of the country. Sun City West had a 13% prevalence rate for REM behavior disorder. So we're famous. We, we, we're number one for uh, REM behavior disorder. And so that's why a lot of the epidemiological studies for REM behavior disorder actually come out of Arizona. Um, the minimum diagnostic criteria to have REM behavior disorder is that um, there's potentially harmful sleep behavior, and so it can often be pretty frightening. It's not just, you know, acting out your dreams and punching. The most harmful case I've ever heard of, um, I've ever seen actually taking care of patients, was um, during fellowship, where a guy um, thought he was being uh, chased by a bear. He would get out of bed, which is actually pretty unusual for someone to leave their bed in REM behavior disorder, but he was convinced he was being chased by a bear, would run straight out of his bed into the wall and smacked his head so hard that he actually sustained a brain bleed to the brain and required um, evacuation, so neurosurgery, where they removed the bone flap and had to take out the bleed, okay? So that's the most profound case I've ever heard. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. And then um, the dreams um, appear to be acted out. It's usually um, by account of the spouse. 
Um, it, it's sleep behavior that disrupts sleep, so it wakes up the patient or their bed partner. And the typical stories we hear are punching or hitting their spouse, running into walls. And I haven't seen this personally, but there have been cases of people actually jumping out of windows. It can be that violent. Um, there is something called an ICSD criteria that we have to follow as uh, sleep uh, people, as sleep specialists, and um, we, we do have to follow this, but REM behavior disorder does require a sleep study in order to diagnose, okay? There are many questionnaires that we follow. There's a really long one that we typically um, used to use like 10 years ago, but it has been overly simplified, which is awesome, by Postuma, who is actually in Montreal. Um, and it's basically one question, okay? So it's, have you ever been told or suspected yourself that you seem to act out your dreams while asleep? Has your bed partner ever said, honey, you punch, you flail your arms, you seem to be dreaming, um, you've hit me, you've injured yourself? And if that's the case, then you should talk to your primary doctor about um, seeing a sleep specialist. We actually have a... Um, a research study where you can get your sleep study, you can get uh, further testing, all um, completely paid for. So um, I can actually give the information to Lori and she can distribute it to you if you're interested in becoming a part of that study. It's called the North American Prodromal um, Synaclinopathy Cine Study. And um, it is involving 11 um, research centers, um, but the primary site is Washington University in St. Louis. The reason why it's, it's, it's so important and the scary aspect of REM behavior disorder is not only because it can be injurious to the patient themselves or their bed partners, is because it's been associated with a lot of devastating neurological diseases, okay? And the most prevalent one is Parkinson's, something called multiple system atrophy, and Lewy body dementia, okay? And um, Parkinson's, if you're not familiar with Parkinson's, um, it, it is, it's a slow neurodegenerative disease. Um, the most common symptoms of Parkinson's are um, its motor. So uh, tremors are very common. It's typically like a pill rolling tremor, um, usually at rest. It's something called bradykinesia, where it's slowness of movement. And one of the common symptoms that I'll hear patients say is, so it's just moving slowly. So for example, uh, reaching for a cup of coffee, it'll be really slow all of a sudden. Um, we, we look for something called cogwheel rigidity. So when uh, you feel their tone, it seems to catch kind of like, um, like a, uh, what do you call it, a pocket knife uh, would kind of clasp um, when, you, when you go to open it. Um, other symptoms are a gait instability, so like a shuffling walk, um, masked facies, so a very expression, uh, uh, a face that was previously full of expression, all of a sudden nobody, um, that person will quit smiling, um, trouble swallowing, um, those are the symptoms that are common for kind of and more advanced Parkinson's. But there are early symptoms of Parkinson's as well, and I'll go through those in a little bit. That can be what we call prodromal or early signs of Parkinson's. Multiple system atrophy is kind of on the spectrum of Parkinson's, and it's where people lose their um, autonomic system um, capabilities. So it's their body's ability to uh, register uh, blood pressure, so all of a sudden their blood pressure kind of fluctuates really quickly. Um, it's constipation, diarrhea, um, it's feeling dizzy all of a sudden when they get up because the blood pressure fluctuations. Um, and it could be very, very progressive and advance very quickly. And then dementia with Lewy body is kind of, if you want to think of it similar as Alzheimer's, but it's a very, uh, very progressive, very rapidly uh, progressive form of dementia where people start developing hallucinations, like visual hallucinations. And unfortunately, REM behavior disorder has a very high predictability of developing a lot of these neurodegenerative disorders. And so it's very important for you to get evaluated um, and see if you're developing those, those symptoms, especially with a neurologist. 
So this was a paper um, that was published in March of 2019. Um, it's by the um, International RBD Study Group, by Postuma um, and others. And what it did show is that um, if you do have REM behavior disorder, it's not caused by medications, it's not caused by, by sleep apnea, that within two decades, so 10 to 20 years, you had a 90% risk of developing Parkinson's or one of the other neurologic disorders. And of over 1,000 patients, um, on, they followed them for up to 20 years. Every year, they had a risk of developing neurologic symptoms at 6% per year. And seven, almost 75% of those patients started having neurological decline, okay, which is pretty scary. And some of those early symptoms, and I'm going to show you some of the early symptoms, but this is a graph showing you how many patients were disease-free after 15 years. And you can see it was a dis, uh, steady decline. And half of those patients developed Parkinson's. Half of those patients developed um, diffuse Lewy body dementia. And it's pretty scary right now because we can't really predict which patients are more likely to develop Parkinson's or not. So we see young patients as young as 19 years old, and then we see older patients as old as 88, 90, 90-year-old 90 patients with REM behavior disorder, and we have to counsel them kind of the same in terms of their risk of Parkinson's. So um, what we see now is when we see our young and old patients, as soon as we go through the data that we have right now, we get multiple calls after our consultation and they're freaking out because they say, oh my gosh, you know what? I actually see some tremors. And you know, after what you told me, I, I kind of think that I, I am developing Parkinson's. Can I go see that movement disorder, that Parkinson's specialist you told me about? Because I really do want to try some of those Parkinson's medications. And the probability of them developing some Parkinson's symptoms a few days after the consultation is really unlikely, but it scares them um, because of the data being so strong. A lot of the early symptoms of Parkinson's um, and the development of Parkinson's, so predicting who will develop Parkinson's is loss of smell. Okay, um, so we do like a scratch and sniff smell. Um, so it's basically uh, differentiating certain types of smells that are pretty pungent, loss of color vision. So this is not at birth. You know, a lot of men have uh, loss of green, um, red color vision. This is later in life, but that can be a sign that you could develop uh, Parkinson's later in life. Um, motor dysfunction, so gait instability, balance problems, tremors, dropping things, that type of thing. It can be an early sign. And then like we talked about, autonomic dysfunction. Um, so this is your autom autonomic nervous system. So it's constipation, it's erectile dysfunction, it's knowing, noticing blood pressure fluctuations, um, thermoregulation, so getting really hot, really cold all of a sudden. Um, those could be early signs of Parkinsonian development. Okay. We are doing more research on it, and that's where um, the research is coming into play. There's something called a DAT scan looking at the dopamine um, receptors in your brain, um, and that's where the research study uh, could be funded if you have REM behavior disorder. Okay. Um, REM sleep, um, everybody is always curious about how we discovered REM sleep, and I'm just going to give you some historical facts. It's actually really interesting. We've known about REM sleep since the 1950s, and um, it really was Askerninsky and Kleitman who came up with REM behavior disorder, or excuse me, REM behavior disorder and REM sleep. And Askerinsky, he actually discovered it based on his eight-year-old son. And um, he was up really late at night. His eight-year-old son would come into his office, and they had the old, old sleep machines, which um, some of our older sleep techs might remember. And he, um, he, his son was there. He hooked up his son uh, one night, and it was really late at night. It's an interesting story. And um, around like 2 a.m., he heard um, the machine go crazy, and it usually detects eye movements, so rapid eye movements, your eye fluttering. And he, he got really angry, and he was, he was like, why is my son up? He's supposed to be asleep. It's 2 in the morning. 
And he ran in there to find that his son was actually sleeping, but ha his son was having this rapid eye movements that we now know um, occurs in REM sleep. So um, if you guys have ever looked at your cat, your dog, um, even your children um, in the middle of the night, you can actually see their eyes move um, and they're, they're fast asleep. They're in deep sleep. And that was how REM sleep um, was, was discovered. And he was the fir well, first one who discovered it. Um, they've actually seen it in cats as well. Um, I, I'm sorry for cat lovers here, but a lot of the uh, ways that they um, discovered where it was localized and damaged to the uh, brainstem was they did lesional studies where they um, actually uh, uh, obliterated, so they electrocuted certain parts of the brainstem, and then they found that cats would no longer have dreams, and uh, they would no longer have REM sleep. And that was early on. Um, the way we diagnose it is a sleep study. So some of you might have had sleep studies. And this is what you would look like coming into the lab. You would have EGs on your head. You would have um, leads on your chin to look at activity or tone in your chin. You would have belts on your chest and your abdomen right here. I'm going to point them out. And you would have leads on your legs and on your arms as a part of the REM behavior sleep protocol. And then you'd also have a video, OK? So we basically uh, wire you up, and then we have a video on you with a tech watching you, and then we say, OK, sleep. So um, a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, how do you expect me to sleep? But surprisingly, people do sleep. Um, you are in the comforts of like a modest hotel. Um, in a comfortable bed, um, you have a bedroom, you know, it's, it's pretty comfortable, um, cool environment, um, and we really only need about five minutes of REM sleep or at least two hours of sleep to diagnose uh, REM behavior disorder. Um, I'm going to show you where we actually place the leads, so they are on both legs, on this part where the dots are, on the arms, on the chin, Okay, and I won't go into this, but um, here where you see all this activity, you see all this activity is considered abnormal, okay? So in a normal person, it should be completely silent. It should be like a straight line, almost like a flat line. But here, this patient is acting out a lot, okay? Um, so I'm going to show you here. This is a very severe form of it where this person is really moving a lot, and that is considered abnormal. Um, this is caused by um, somebody on um, some antidepressant medication. So you guys have heard of like um, uh, Zoloft, um, things like uh, Zoloft, uh, fluoxetine, Paxil, Lexapro. Those medications can cause REM behavior disorder. And if um, we see patients and they say, hey, I started an antidepressant and then started acting out my dreams, then we'll talk to the psychiatrist, the primary care doctor, and we'll say, hey, we actually think it's the medication that's causing it. Is there any way that we can switch them to another antidepressant um, and then see if their REM behavior disorder goes away, especially if it's harmful? And um, then we, we know that that's necessarily um, that, that might be the cause. And those forms of REM behavior disorder may not be associated with Parkinson's, but we're not entirely sure. Okay, sleep apnea. Sleep apnea can also cause something called pseudo REM behavior disorder. And so that's why the sleep study is always very important. And it's always important to treat sleep, sleep apnea if you do have it. And I would say about 50% of the time, if the patient has sleep apnea and you treat it with a breathing machine, the REM behavior disorder gets better. But the other 50% of the time, we will have to use medications. Okay. So now I'm going to go to um, some YouTube uh, pictures. And I think here, if I remember correctly, I, I am going to have to switch out the screens in order for you guys to see it. So I'm going to just... Give me a chance here to, I'm going to pause it. Okay, and then I am going to just switch, switch the screen here so you can actually see it. Okay, can you guys see the screen? And you yeah. let me, okay, perfect. So this is actually, I'm going to lower the sound here. So this is actually of a patient in a sleep center, 
And you can see, let's see, let me go back here because you might have missed it. But uh, let's see. But you can see the movement here and, oh, sorry. And you can see this person moving the legs a little bit, but there's also, hopefully you were able to see it, but she was actually moving her, she was kind of punching with her left arm. This is not the most impressive one, so I'm actually gonna show you some of the other ones. Let's see if it'll play again. Oh, okay. Let me show you some of the more impressive ones. Okay, and you can still see the screen, right? Yes. Okay, Perfect. good. Okay, so I'm going to show you this guy here. All right, so pretty impressive. Um, he, there's always a sense of fear um, with these dreams. And you can see why he probably is sleeping alone. Um, you know, he's all over the bed. Um, you, you probably could appreciate the bed stand was really close to him and there's like a water, a glass of water. Um, I, I, if I were his doctor, I'd say move that bed stand over. It's way too close to you and you probably shouldn't have any water. We recommend padding for someone who is that um, active. And then I'm going to show you one more. Full screen. So sleeping soundly at first. Now just pretend you are right next to him. Ouch. Yeah, that would hurt. So um, yeah, so it can go from sleeping pretty soundly to being pretty violent. Okay, so let me switch now. Okay, can you share? And okay, I think we're back to the PowerPoint. Yeah, we are. That's okay, great. so treatment. Okay, so it's excluding other causes like sleep apnea, looking at all the medications, making sure there's not a medication that's exacerbating it. But if we ruled out everything and the patient is really injuring themselves, we do have to add on medications. I always try melatonin first. Um, and we usually, if the patient is really injuring themselves, we have to start at three milligrams. And we may have to titrate up to 12 milligrams. And it typically helps patients. But if they are still acting out their dreams, we have to go to something called benzodiazepines. So you guys have heard of like Valium used for anxiety. Um, we use something that is a little bit longer acting called clonopin or clonazepam. And we'll start it at like 0.25 or 0.5 milligrams. Um, we, this is like a subset of patients that we reserve clonazepam for because there are a lot of side effects with it. It does have um, some addictive quality, dependence, and tolerance. So um, it's, it's a medication that acts on the same receptors as alcohol. So we don't take this medication very lightly. But you can understand that these patients are at risk of harming themselves. So this is a subset of patients that we will use it for. Um, but very carefully and monitor it. It, it, it is a scheduled medication. Um, there are other medications that we'll use too, like gabapentin, also called Neurontin. There's also a patch called the retigotine patch um, that is uh, actually used for Parkinson's um, that has shown some um, efficacy as well. 
We'll use some of the um, antidepressant medications, interestingly, um, some of the seizure medications, some of the other Parkinson's medications. Um, but the most important thing is really to remove some of the triggers and then also to look at the bedroom and make sure that it's safe. So a lot of the patients will move the bedside uh, table. We'll ask them to put a, a mattress, whether it's a twin mattress, uh, blow up mattresses have been really uh, popular these days, and then have them blow it up and put it next to their bed. So if they were to roll off, they wouldn't injure themselves or hurt themselves and then remove anything dangerous inside the room. So the most memorable case I have is actually a police officer, a retired police officer who kept a loaded gun in his room. And um, when he, his, his REM behavior disorder, his dreams would always be um, previous dreams of, a, a, of, of basically fighting off a criminal. And then he would go down to grab his gun and then hold it at his wife's head, fully loaded. And luckily nothing happened, but we immediately told his wife, take the guns out of the room, put them in a safe where you know this, the, the code only and he doesn't, um, because obviously that was a danger to both himself and her. Um, there's a case, there's a case study um, in the sleep journal where uh, there's a man who had a knife. He would keep a knife as, as a weapon and he was dreaming that somebody was robbing him and he ended up stabbing his wife. Okay, so you want to make sure there are no weapons at all. We have had some patients um, sleep in a sleeping bag so they're not punching their spouse when their spouse refuses to leave the bed, having bed rails up, um, locking the door um, to their bedroom um, so they don't leave the bedroom, um, but making sure that the, be the bedroom environment is very safe. Okay, and I'm going to skip this. Um, and then I am going to turn it over to um, Cyrus is our sleep lab manager. We, we've been doing research on uh, better ways to capture REM behavior disorder because a lot of patients come into the lab. It is, um, it is a lot of work to bring a patient in. You can imagine have them fully hooked up with a wire um, and then have them not act out their dreams. Um, and so we've been working with uh, Dan Lewandowski, um, on finding ambulatory ways, so ways that patients can actually take a device home uh, for several days in the comforts of their, their own home to capture REM behavior disorder instead of having to come repetitive nights in the sleep center. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over, oops, to Cyrus. Hello. So this is the um, sleep profiler device. Um, there's a lot of home study devices out there. Um, the difference with this one is we do a frontal polar um, monitoring, which monitors the EMG, EOG, and EEG. That way we can differentiate different sleep stages. Um, the cool thing is, sorry, our... Cyrus, would you mind um, stop sharing her screen and then we can see that device a little bit better? Yes. Okay, thank you. And then show it again, that'd be fabulous. Go ahead and see this. Okay. Here we go. I don't oh. know if your internet or my internet cut out for a minute. Perfect. I can see you guys now. There you go. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. I'll start from the beginning. This is uh, this is the sleep profiler. Um, I don't know if you've seen these, but there's a lot of home sleep study devices out there. Uh, the difference with this one is um, we have a frontal polar um, monitoring so it monitors the EEG, the eyes, and the EMG. So it, it, it helps us with differentiating different sleep stages. Um, it also has a pulse oximeter um, to monitor for pulse rate and oxygen CO2. Um, it's nice because it, it, it just recharges um, and we do multi uh, sleep studies. Typically what happens when um, and they have a real disorder or anything like that, a lot of it doesn't go that much. So this device uh, will uh, monitor multiple days and catch a lot of that um, REM behavioral disorder. 
Um, it does have a three-hour battery on it. You just recharge it in 30 hours. Um, also, the patient can use this for up to seven days. Uh, so after once they use it for the, the week, um, we can dial it, and it's for night, and you can compare the each night. This is nice because it does have a patient come in for multiple PS studies. EDG for EKG. We can monitor or for teeth grinding. We also have their national cannula to monitor for apnea and stuff like that. Um, the nice part, one of our And uh, this uh, also it has um Hello again. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm sorry. We, we're having a little bit of internet issue, and I'm not sure if it's on your end or my end. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Can you? Yeah, they, I think it might be you guys' internet a little bit, cut, cutting in and out fine, and I'm not oh, okay. sure. There we are. Can you hear us now or? Yes, oh. yes. All right, we've lost them again. I apologize, everyone that's on the webinar. Uh, are you guys able to hear me okay? I'm just trying to determine if it's my internet or the hospitals. We may have lost them completely. There you are. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, it is a lot better. I think we saw most of um, the uh, device. Okay. So. Let me just, um, and then uh, near the end of it, let me just show you this. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay. And then we'll just conclude. Um, so the ambulatory device, we really have compared with um, an in-lab sleep study. And it's been pretty good at predicting um, sleep staging and everything else. So we've been pretty impressed. And I think that's pretty much near the end of it. So I will open it to questions, Lori, okay. if that's good. Great. I do have a couple of questions. Yes. So this comes from a colleague. Uh, do you think it is? that Robin Williams hung himself in an RBD episode. He had RBD body dementia, and he was on SSRIs, and the SSRIs are the uh, antidepressants that she spoke about earlier, just in case anybody wants to know what those letters are. Would you like to comment on that? Oh, gosh, okay. That that could be really controversial, and, and I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know enough about the circumstances of Robin Williams. It was obviously devastating for all of us who grew up knowing him um, and watching all of his movies, but, you know, I think anything is possible, um, and from what I know um, and from what I've heard, um, which is all 
you know, through the media, through um, third um, third references, everything I've heard, biographies, etc. My sense was that Robin Williams suffered from a long history of depression, and he was on various medications. And there is a strong possibility that he could have been on antidepressants that could have caused REM behavior disorder. Absolutely. Um, but it's all very um, hypothetical at this point. Um, I've never seen a case documented of REM behavior disorder causing an actual suicide. Um, but it's a possibility for sure. And yeah. I've never heard of that, but absolutely. If you have any side effects of suicidal thoughts, please call someone right away. It's, you know, when you go on medication, it can happen. Um, thank you for giving us your opinion on that. Okay, here's, here's another one. Uh, what are the treatment options for Parkinson's patients who have moderate OSA plus essential tremors during sleep? Yeah, okay. So um, moderate OSA um, is going to be CPAP is first line. We know that. Um, so it's positive airway pressure. It's the breathing machine. Um, we know that there are other, if they can't tolerate the breathing machine, there are alternative therapies, whether it's the oral appliance, whether the, it's the Inspire device, which is the hypoglossal nerve stimulator. Um, there are alternative forms, but the gold standard of treatment is the breathing machine at night. Okay. Um, and it works. Um, yes, it I have works. Some apnea. There are ways to get used to it, finding the right mask. Um, work with a sleep specialist who help who can help you get used to it, but it's not for everybody. It's not a failure if you can't get used to it. It's not for everybody. So there are alternative treatments. The tremors are very common in Parkinson's patients, and there are various forms of treatment for it. Um, so you guys have heard of Cinemet, which is carbidopa, levodopa. Um, there are medications that we also use for um, restless leg. So there's Mirapex, there's Requip, um, there's Amantadine. Um, there are various forms of medications that are used. We call them dopamine agonists. Um, I'm, I'm not a strong proponent in primary care doctors or non-neurologists or even general neurologists starting these medications. There are specialized Parkinson's neurologists, and we call movement disorder neurologists, who start these medications. And Parkinson's disease is a hard diagnosis to make. You don't just see a patient once and say, you have Parkinson's. It's you see the patients multiple times, and it's a diagnosis that you make over a series of evaluations. It's a hard diagnosis, and you don't want to commit a patient to the diagnosis right away. So um, there are various movement disorder neurologists in the valley. Um, you can Google it. Um, you, can, uh, you can go to the website. You can contact me. Um, Laurie can give you my contact. Um, I would always say go with a network, okay? Um, there are various ones at Honor Health, Mayo, uh, Banner, uh, private practice, community. Um, but if you're concerned about Parkinson's, definitely go see a Parkinson's specialist. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you were going to give us the information. If anybody has a last question, ask now or forever hold your peace. No, I'm kidding. You can reach out to me and I will connect you with Dr. Iannotti. Do you have any, um, do you want to give us the information on the study? I think we have some providers watching, so I was encouraging them to ask questions. Um, so, Lori, I will send you over the, um, it's called the NAPS Consortium, and there's a pamphlet associated with it. Why don't I give you um, the, I will send it over to you. I'll email it to you, um, okay. the coordinator's contact number. And okay. any patients that are interested, um, just give them the pamphlet. Okay. Um, we can even send you um, some of the pamphlets. And then they call her, and then she coordinates everything. Okay, fantastic. So, if you guys are on the webinar, you're going to get a follow-up email from me tomorrow, or you got one reminding you of the webinar, feel free to respond to that and ask me for Dr. Iannotti's uh, study information or her information, and that was a great webinar. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you. Thank, thank you, Cyrus. I'm sorry your internet wasn't good. Uh, no problem. That was so weird. It was just random, like right when you're supposed to be talking. That's it. it just hurt my feelings a little bit. I know. <laughs> it's really great that there is a home sleep testing device out there that we can use to help with this because it's, you know, hard sometimes to bring someone who's fearful of hurting someone else in a sleep center. And so thanks for sharing that, you guys. 
And thank you, Lori, for the invitation. And we just want to say thank you so much for having this uh, series, this patient education series. Um, you've done so much work in helping us educate the community. Um, so thank you again. You're a real You're patient so advocate. There, you know? And you know what I love is here we are competitors, but yet there's enough fish in the sea and there's so many undiagnosed sleep disorders out there, people, like it, we're all a family, come see Absolutely. somebody, get, yes. get your health in order, now's the time, right? Yes, yeah. amen. All right, thanks you Stay guys, safe, everyone. Bye. You too, bye-bye.